um, Toronto. Let's see which is this next to shift. <laughs> Close the window. How you guys doing? You know that sound? No, that's not play. That's play. There we go. Okay, hi, Michael Muller. That's my name. Good to be here. Um, excited you guys are all here. And uh, it's, it's wonderfully humbling to walk next to the packed room over there filled with people <laughs> bristling out. But I'd actually prefer, uh, prefer this, this crowd because it feels a little more intimate. Um, so a little bit about myself, I, uh, I grew up, I spent a couple years in Saudi Arabia as a, as a child and got to travel around and see the world. My dad was building a city uh, in Jubail, Saudi Arabia. This was the first camera I got. It was a Minolta Weathermatix, waterproof. Don't know who that kid in the picture is. but So I, did, I lived there for a couple years and moved back to the United States. And at about the age of 15, started, my, my father's hobby was photography. So I started taking pictures pretty early on, and around 15, 16, started shooting snowboarding because the sport was just emerging. And uh, the other guy in the photo, Justin Hostinek, was my schoolmate. His parents came from Europe, and uh, his parents gave him his college money, and we started the first snowboarding calendar. And uh, we would go to Europe together at like 16, 17, Colorado, traveling the world and, and shooting snowboarders and making this calendar and starting to get published. And at the same time, I was, sh uh, I was shooting bands. So I would call the record labels. This is before the Internet and say that I was shooting for the Contra Costa Times or the local newspapers. And I'd get a photo pass. So I went to like every concert, Rolling Stones, James Addiction. I mean, all of them until the real photographer showed up at Paul McCartney and the gig was a bit up. But um, I got the pass before him. So, <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, adventure is sort of in my DNA. This is Kilimanjaro. Um, it's it's uh, it's sort of a thread that stayed throughout my life. I'm a big, big proponent of of doing what you love, or sort of shooting or creating stuff that's around you or that's that you're passionate about. Um, so this was uh, a trip I took. Um, to raise awareness about the sustainable, the uh, you know sustainable drinking water around the world, the lack of thereof, um, and like she had mentioned, I'm a UN global advocate, so I do a lot of these trips. Uh, this was a trip where we summited Kilimanjaro with a, a bunch of sort of actors and musicians and what have you. Uh, it's one of the toughest toughest things I've done. Uh, we summited in a in a whiteout actually, and um, there was like premier mountain. Uh, photographer climber on the trip as well and I schlepped my strobe lights up to the top of the mountain and since we were in a whiteout um, the only way to get the shot the group shot was with the strobe so I actually got the shot that went out on the AP and out on the wire and I was like yeah um, but at the same time he's a good buddy and, and I sort of schooled him on bringing lights up and that's sort of my take on on photography and creating is doing Doing stuff that hasn't been done before or doing it in a way that people don't normally do it. Like people don't normally bring lights to the top of a mountain. Um, you know, on our, on our way we left, I, I think we landed in the wrong country here. We landed in Sudan on our way to Ethiopia. And it was pretty funny to uh, have these guys with machine guns pull up and our UN chick guys say, ah, I'm sorry, we're, we landed in the wrong country. Um, so it's, it's fun having adventures like that. And, um, you know, there were, there were, like I said, some actors that came along. And in this, this, this day and age we live in, they're the ones that have the soapbox. I mean, that's who people listen to. I mean, I've seen, like, in L.A., you know, six kids shot in Watts. But Will Smith, you know, bumped his knee, and that's what gets the headlines. Um, and, you know, I think uh, the quicker... At least I accepted that and said, you know, okay, well, that's the way it is today. So, you know, how can we, how can I maximize that with the causes that I'm working with? Um, but it's a really rewarding uh, experience to use my, my skills or my gifts to tell people stories that don't otherwise get a chance to tell, uh, which I've had quite a few of these refugees, like, you know, come up and say, you know, tell the world that we're here because they're shoved in a corner and they're forgotten. Uh, and I feel as a photographer, it's my duty to 
sort of document and, and show the world what's happening uh, in all aspects, whether it's the glamorized Hollywood or, you know, what's going on in these refugee camps around the world. Um, you know, it's, it's when you do these projects, you, you don't get paid. You know, you're donating your time. You're donating your, your energy. You're sacrificing time away from my family. Um, and at the same time, I've had, you know, a lot of my, my peers ask me, like, how do you work so much? How do you stay working? Like, in the last 10 years, we've had a couple recessions. And my career has, has gone sort of like that. And, and that's truly, I believe, because I give. I think it's a universal law. Uh, we get so focused on, like, the next job and, and how do I, you know, my career. And um, I believe that the more you give, the more it comes back to you, the more space you make for your life to have it come back. Uh, and it's just, for me, a, le- a lot more rewarding than a paycheck. I mean, believe me, there's some paychecks that are really rewarding, but as quickly as you get that check, it's, it's gone. So I don't know about any of you, but I've got three daughters and a wife, so I don't make any money. They make the money. Um, but, uh, and that's, you know, that's another thing. I've never, never, ever uh, chased money in my career. I, I really... You know, when I tell people, especially young people, like, you know, what do you want to do? You know, what do you love to do? Um, Because I never have woken up and been like, oh, I got to go to work today. Ever. Ever. Even if I'm shooting something that's like, you know, not my most favorite. I get to go, I get paid to go get to create. It's like, (laughs) that's, that's the winning gig. So, you know, I like to do things that are personal projects to me, like stuff that I'm interested in. Like this was a, a, I spent two years documenting outlaw bikers. Uh, that was probably one of the most, when I had 150 of those guys, I was on the back of a trailer like this and I had 150 like you guys. And I was like yelling at them. I'm like, okay, slide over here, you know, move that. And like literally in my head at the same time going, any one of these guys could kill me four different ways to Sunday. And, um, that afternoon, I went down to Sacramento and took photos of the mayor and the governor. It was such a, a dichotomy, outlaw bikers and an AIDS you know, benefit that afternoon. Um, but uh, that's something that I've always sort of uh, kept in my, in my photography is doing sort of passion projects um, and stuff that, that there's, no, there's no boss, there's no art director, there's no paycheck involved. It's just shooting stuff that I find interesting and you know, those guys, you see them at a gas station. That's it. Like, people, you don't photograph those guys. Uh, you just don't. They don't let you. In fact, when I first showed up, they were like, oh, DEA, you know, FBI. They were making comments, you know. And by the end of the day, they're like, yo, Mike, come here, shoot this, you know. And so, uh, and that's, you know, that's part of my job is to earn, earn their trust. Um, this is a little overview of, of my life, you know. Uh, when I was in, when I was growing up, I did triathlons. You know, I was fifth in the world, swam, bike, and ran. When I was, you know, 18, it was that, it was that choice: do I want to be a professional triathlete or do I want to do my photography? And I'm like, I do not want to swim, bike, and run for 10 more years. Then what am I going to do after that? Um, so I chose photography. Uh, about 10, 12 years ago, Speedo had been using the same photographer for 15 years. And the owner retired, and they went on a worldwide hunt for a photographer. I mean, they were looking everywhere. And I was like, that is my job. Like, I want that job. So I found, like, the old newspaper clippings, and I found out one year I was actually sponsored by Speedo, and I circled it, and I called them, and I'm like, I know swimming. I know your sport. I know it inside and out, and let me do this. And I ended up getting the job and shot nine years consecutively uh, through two Olympics, you know, Michael Phelps and Amanda Beard and all of them. Um, and shot them in sort of every way you can when you spend nine years working on a particular project and every year you have to change it. Um, but really at the, at the same time, I was wanting to evolve. And when you're shooting underwater with available light, I wanted to sort of bring the, the studio underwater. I wanted to shoot them and freeze Michael. And so it was sort of a dual thing. I was shooting them, and then, you know, sharks were in my radar, and I wanted to shoot sharks. And I had this vision. I was driving. I'm like, I want to shoot a shark like I shoot Iron Man. I want to edge light it and front light it. And I'm like, well, I can't bring the shark to the studio because it'll be dead. So I got to bring the, the, the studio to the sharks. Well, I went online to find lights, and there was two lights, 400 watt that every scuba diver uses, and then big movie lights, like HMI, that like James Cameron, neither one of those could work for me. So I started to look to make, uh, you know, to make a light that, that 
you know, would do what I wanted to do, which, you know, I, I sent one guy in Colorado a ton of money. I don't even want to say how much. And he sent me back a metal box with a hole cut out with a piece of plexi that you put on. Like, I literally almost cried. I was like, oh, my God. And then I'm like, the doubt that comes in as, as an artist, like, who do you think you are? You can't make a light. Like, the fear. That's, for me, what I deal with is fear and faith. Either I'm going to do this or I let fear creep in, and it'll usually, you know, it's like a virus, take over and screw my life up. So, I, you know, I have to sort of crush through those walls of fear and just say, no, I'm going to do it. Um, growing up, you know, I'm a little bit all over the place, but when I moved to, you know, I, I went and shot snowboarding when I made that decision from triathlons. I went to Colorado for a year and shot snowboarding, and then a friend of mine in L.A. said, you got to come to L.A. So at 19, I moved to L.A. My first non-snowboarding photos were of, of Baltazar Getty and David Arquette. This is, mind you, in like 90, 91 this is before the internet, before publicists, and all the young sort of actors, we'd all hang out at this place called the Formosa Cafe because they would serve underage um, people. And it was, you know, Drew Barrymore, Leonardo DiCaprio. I mean, it was like, you know, the sort of now who's who, but at then they, they didn't have, Titanic wasn't out, you know what I mean? So, and we would just go like, let's go take pictures. So it was a really fun time. It was very different than it is now. Uh, and that's how I started shooting this stuff. I started shooting that and, and a lot of music. I had those music contacts from when I was, you know, in high school, bullshitting my way and shooting the concerts. Well, I knew all the label people and started shooting them. And um, I remember, like, these are two perfect examples. I remember when Spin called about Green Day. I'm like, Green Day? That's the name of the band? You know, like, whatever. I went up to Berkeley, and we hit it off and ended up shooting, like, all their weddings and went on tour with them. Same thing with Jewel. Like, I'm like, Jewel? I remember taking the album cover, this thing in my room, and, like, throwing like, yeah, whatever. I ended up shooting her. But uh, I did a lot of music uh, in the 90s. Music was something, you know, that... that uh, that was, it was great in the 90s. There was a lot of money involved. Um, I love music. Um, in the last, you know, whatever, five, ten years, we know what's happened to the music industry. The bottom fell out. Um, the budgets have been cut. Uh, I still love to shoot them. Um, but I do, I do a little, a lot less. I usually shoot. I, I do love collaborating. I just did Billy Idols with Shepard Ferry. It's fun to collaborate with other artists. I spent three months, you know, shooting Rihanna. Um, that was an interesting one. Uh, you know, I shot Rihanna also for Kodak. Uh, I do do quite a bit of advertising, you know, and, and Kodak to me was a big one. Um, I remember I went to Times Square and literally, like, took the train up, sat in Times Square and looked up at the Kodak billboard and took a couple minutes in and was like, wow, I did Kodak. That's me and I'm in Times Square because it's easy to get a little jaded sometimes when you start seeing your stuff sort of, you know, work. And, and, I, and I had to stop myself and be like, you know, Wow, I'm proud of that. That's Kodak. Um, we just, I just did this with Christopher Watkin for this last Super Bowl with him doing the sock thing, which was uh, fun. I always get excited. Like, I've never shot Chris Watkin. So to shoot Chris Watkin, I was like, that's, that's going to be a fun one. Um, Deed Eyewear, I shot their campaign 20 years ago, and this is the 20-year anniversary. Um, the owner likes a real polished look, as you can see. Uh, LeBron's last ad as a Cavalier for Nike, which uh, about three weeks ago, I just shot Kobe Bryant's last ad as a, as a Laker for Nike. And that was pretty freaking cool to be there and be like, wow, this is Kobe's last ad. Um, I've shot him a few times over the years, and he's a huge shark freak. And so uh, that's always a, a fun thing when you get to sort of shoot your, your uh, not idols, but people that you respect. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of fashion. When I was 18, I made a very conscious decision that I did not want to do fashion because I didn't want to move to New York or Europe. Um, my sexual preference was strike one against me. I didn't really, that world is just not something, I didn't want to deal with models every day, but I still do some. This was for Gucci with, with Chris Evans, but editorial work, I got to say, is, is my favorite because... You, and even today, it's getting a lot more controlled. It used to be you had total creative freedom. But there are magazines like Flaunt that I work with that let me do whatever I want. And some of my sort of favorite photos have been, you know, when I do editorial. And, and I can do and get creative and do what you want. 
Um, I love it, you know, exploring with lighting and um, sort of looks. I think as you can see, you know, even from the last set to this, that I don't have a certain look. Uh, and that was also a very conscious decision. I've had a lot of agents that say, oh, you got to have a look. Like, you know, the, that's your signature look. And I'm like, I, I don't want to have that, that look. Because the problem with having that look is that the minute you want to do something else, the clients or people are like, no, 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 no. We want that look. We don't want you doing something else or we would hire that person. So I've left my, my palette really open from available light to very stylized. I do all my own post, which is incredibly important with photography or working on imagery is knowing once you take that raw file and what you do with that raw file, that's where it's all at. That's the modern, modern dark room. I, and I know most of my peers don't do their own posts. They have retouchers and they have people they hand it off to. For me, I'm like... I want to know, and I do, when I'm shooting, I know in my head from start to finish what I can do. And then when I look at my images, I don't know. I go, oh, should that be black or white or color? And when I look at them, I'm like black and white, you know? So uh, those people, I can't find someone that'll make that judgment call for me. So it's something that, you know, I need to do. But this is one of my uh, more favorite, you know, editorials, uh, that helicopter before the magazine called. And he's like, I got a helicopter for you. That's it. So they don't give me any money. I'm like, okay, I got a helicopter to work with. So I called, uh, you know, I had this vision to do like a Charles Manson meets, uh, who's the guy that did the Kool-Aid? Um, you know, who had everyone drink the Kool-Aid? <laughs> cult, like a cult leader type thing. Jim, yeah, Jim Jones meets Charles Manson type thing. And, you know, when you try to pitch a story like that to an actor, and I'm like, I've got some followers, which are these cute girls. And he's like, listen, my wife, and his wife, like, directed Fifty Shades of Grey. She's an artist. She's like, he's like, I promised her I would never do shoots with women. I'm like, I get it, dude. I'm married. I get it. You got to trust me. I'm not going to put you in any position that's going to get you in trouble with your wife. And fortunately, he's like, all right, fine. Let's do it. I trust you. Let's do whatever you want. I'm like, thank you. And we ended up doing this whole shoot out in the desert. We flew out. We landed and did the entire shoot in three hours and, and then flew out of there. And they, I think they ran, like, 44 pictures. Uh, which was a huge spread for, for a magazine. But we got, got some, some really amazing images. Um, it was funny because the editor called me when I was on the shoot, and he's like, get a picture of his butt. Get a picture of his butt. I'm like, Lewis, I already got his shirt off, man. Like, what are you asking for? And when he was showering, he literally went and flashed me his butt. And I was like, because I always have my camera with my finger on the trigger. And I actually got the butt. So I was like, there you go. Um, you know, uh, there's infrared photography, uh, was one of my favorite things back in the day, which makes colors really wild. And then black and white makes wherever the sun hits glow. And, uh, I, you know, film these days, you, it's hard to find labs that do it, but actually, you know, there are digital backs that do infrared now. Um, but once again, editorially, you know, is where a lot of my, you know, uh, sort of commercial work, you know, stems from. Um, I love playing with light and what light does, whether it's the sparklers or long shutters. And, you know, this is for a film campaign. So instead of doing the traditional real clean, experimenting, you know, when I'm doing these big commercial projects. And um, that takes, you know, the studios trusting you and me sort of just saying, screw it. What are they going to do? You know, hopefully hire me again. But, you know, for instance, the movie posters was... Um, was a job I wanted to do for so long. I was like, I remember going to the movie theaters with my wife and I'd look up, I'm like, I want to do those, man. Like, why am I not doing those? And the truth is, is that there's like four guys that do 90% of the posters. It's a very hard club to get into. And, you know, I had agents. Once again, if you guys have agents or people, like advice from people, I don't know. I just don't listen to any of it. I listen to my gut. Um, because every, every, in retrospect, I can look back and they were all wrong. All of them were wrong. All their suggestions on how to get movie posters. So how I got the movie posters was once again, a personal project. I was driving up. I saw a stormtrooper at an intersection and I'm like, what would you never see a stormtrooper doing? Smoking a cigarette ever. I'm like, so the Marlboro man, you know, meets stormtroopers. So I spent three months documenting these guys that hang out in front of the Chinese theater and pose with tourists. 
and, you know, took him in the back alleyway. And, you know, here's Batman with piss on the wall and he's smoking something. And I do a gallery show uh, and it sold out. And, and uh, Al Gore's current TV did a special on it and came down. And I brought him a print of that. And I'm like, everyone was like, what's he smoking? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know, man. We like, I don't know. So when we met him and I gave him the print, he's like, oh, shoot, you got me smoking crack. And I'm like, it's crack? Yes. So it became Batman smoking, I don't know, to Batman smoking crack was the, the name of the image. And uh, an actor bought that Batman smoking crack, put it up on his wall. The head of the marketing of a studio came over to talk about a project. He said, whoa, who shot this? He, and he remembered me saying I wanted to shoot movie posters. He's like, this guy, Michael Muller, pulled up my website. He's like, get him over here right now. So he calls me. He's like, you got to be at my house in 10 minutes. I'm like, what? He's like, just get here. I'm like, okay, okay. Ran over there, and he gave me... Uh, my first movie poster, which was the biggest movie of, of that studio's for that year, which was X-Men 3. And he's like, I'm not just going to give you that one. I'm going to give you another one. He gave me that in Pathfinder. And I never shot a movie poster, so I went up and, and did what I did here. I basically would find these places on the sets and shoot them. That's in a broom closet with a multiple exposure. So I left my shutter open for two seconds, popped the strobe three times. And then, you know, went to Holly Berry, and I'm like, listen, so here's the deal. You know, I shot Hugh with this, and I showed her that shot. And I'm like, you know, you don't have to do it, but it's going to be Hugh up in Times Square otherwise. And so she's like, no, no, I'm doing it. And uh, the, the production came over, like, we need you on the set. She's like, Give, I, I'm doing this shot, and I need 10 minutes. And then, you know, we went in the broom closet and did it, so... <laughs> um, ego is something that you learn. Everyone, we all have one. And appealing to it and soothing it is my job, you know, because if you show someone a screen and there are 99 photos and 98 of them, they look great. And there's one that they look fat, bad, whatever. They are going to zoom in on that one image and be like, oh, my God, look how horrible I look. And you're like, well, there's 98 other ones that you look great. Um, but, you know, that's that's when you're doing portraits. It's it's sort of I feel my job is to, uh, you know, make them. Make them feel good. Anyways, back to the movie posters. I did that, and literally, like, two weeks later, Spider-Man called. And then I was in, in the club, and when Marvel formed, they called me up, and they said, hey, we want you to do, you know, Robert had showed me. He's like, man, this is going to be so cool, this whole thing. And they're like, we want you to do it. And I'm like, I want to spend a couple, like, you know, I want to spend time on the set. I don't want to just do the seamless. And I spent two weeks, and I've pretty much done every Marvel movie since, and it's been a, a great ride. I really enjoy. I'm a superhero. I love comic stuff. I mean, that's, you know, it's my thing. I love it. I love that little world. It's like sharks and superheroes. Um, so, you know, it's been, it's been a really fun ride. And, and at the same time, these big commercial blockbusters, they're great. But I, you know, for the respect level, love doing these smaller projects. You know, this was a project I did. I'm still here. Spring Breakers, you know, with Harmony Corinne. And doing st things like that were, uh, were fun. Deadpool, you know, came out, R-rated movie. You know, um, we did, I think, 40 different little sort of photos in, in one sitting in three hours from, like, the Burt Reynolds to him sitting on the toilet and just cranked through it. And that's because Ryan wanted to do it. And I was like, so smart, dude, because if you come out being all trying to be badass, this movie's going to tank. And, you know, they did this real kitschy thing, and it, and it did well. Um, whereas Zoolander, which came out the same weekend, which I assumed would do amazing, didn't do so well. Uh, the marketing campaign was big, and you just never know with movies, you know? Um, but marketing is a, is a very key component to it. And how I know I look, if I look up at a billboard and it's bad, I'm like, that movie looks horrible, right? And if it's good, it looks great. Which brings me back to that little kid with the Minolta camera, with the Weathermatic, whose first shot, shot in life was of a shark out of a magazine. I took a photo of a shark in a, in a time, in a National Geographic, showed my buddies. They were so impressed. About 10 years ago, my wife sent me on my first shark trip. She heard me talking about it. I went to Guadalupe and shot the sharks with no lights and... I had a huge fear of sharks. And the minute I saw that first shark and I saw its eye and it's like, I see you, you see me, everything melted away. And I was like hanging out of the cage halfway. And you can see the cinema cage. I mean, a shark can swim right, we're down at 30 feet right up in there. But I still was in the cage at this point. Uh, I look like I'm out of the cage, but I'm hanging halfway out of the cage in these shots. 
Um, and I did these shots, and then you see the watch that I'm wearing, IWC. That was sort of my first shot that I made this shark poster of. Uh, you know, Shepard, uh, his Obey campaign I've been seeing for 30 years, and he's a buddy. I'm like, you know what? I've never seen it. I'm going to put a shark smiling up all over the place with no hashtag, no W, just a smiling shark. So I made these six-foot posters and put them up all over the world. And I would go to, like, you know, New Zealand to shoot Spartacus, and that night I'd go out and glue up shark posters everywhere. Um, and uh, I knew I'd get arrested at some point. So I had a bail bondsman on call, which it, which it did happen, you know. So I was like, I got to find other ways of getting the message out there because, you know, when I, was, when I was in the Galapagos, once again, I have these lights. So I'm shooting sharks in a way I've never been shot before with 1,200 watts times, you know, three or four of them. Which, you know, when you have light underwater, um, it really changes it. So I showed the owner of IWC that one shark shot, and he gave me their Aqua Timer campaign on the spot, which, you know, giving a Hollywood portrait photographer an underwater huge campaign, all of his, like, underlings were looking at him like he was crazy. And I didn't even have the lights ready at that point. But I got them the day before we went on the trip, and I spent two weeks at sea, and we crushed it and got, like, the most phenomenal imagery and when I was on that trip I really had a moment I was like you know I don't think my kids are going to see half these animals you know and the fulfillment I had from shooting these animals and bringing my studio tech you know my studio skills into that environment which no one really had done I was like this is what I my life has led up to this point and maybe I can I've sold billions in movie posters and Nike and Range Rover maybe I can maybe I can help sell a change of perception on our planet and on these animals and what's happening. And I, and I went from that point on and did everything sort of I could to do the shark project. I did 30 expeditions, um, you know, and they're all self-financed. You have to, I have to charter the whole boat. You can see the lighting setups that we have to do this, you know, crew of seven guys. And then I had film crews that were documenting each one of these. You see how big those sharks are, but you know, to see a shark coming out of light in my head, I was like, I'd never see it. I know if I saw that, I'd be like, whoa. And my goal is to then, you know, turn the page and, and educate people. Most shark shots, when you see it, it's real black. It's like a black hole. It's like a lifeless. And if you see, this is done with the 80 megapixel with my lights. You can see the iris. You see the eye of that shark. It's like a human eye. And that's what you really see when you're down there. It's like you go, oh, I, it's, it's an eyeball in there. There's like a, there's something in there. So I had to overcome my fear because I had a huge fear, but I wanted to swim with these things. And I spent the next, you know, 10 years, hundreds of hours with tiger sharks and bull sharks. Uh, and I like treating them in these ways. Like, you know, doing my own post allows me to find these sort of, you know, various ways of doing it. And... Um, for instance, you know, there's 200 hammerhead sharks. When I swam into that shark, every one of those sharks swam away from me. <laughs> um, they're, they're not, we're not on their menu. They're not after us. Um, you know, we're more scared of them. But, you know, to do this stuff, it, it, I found a team, and it's all about your team. Um, and, you know, we get, you can see how, I mean, that's a 14-foot great hammerhead, and you have to sort of manhandle them. Um, but, you know, learning to master, and people ask about my crossover. Well, when I do when I do movie poster stuff or portraiture, I love smoke. I love making that cinematic look. So when I was in Bimini, I saw the white sand kick up, and then it hit me. I'm like, oh, my God, a shark coming out of smoke. So I'd put my camera in between my legs, and I'd lift up a bunch of, of sand and then back up as the shark's coming at me and get the uh, shark swimming through the smoke, so to speak. Um. You know, my crew is all the, my same assistants that uh, that had traveled with me. Sharks breaching. We've seen, you know, this has been known, seeing these sharks in South Africa breaching. Well, I wanted to see if they breached at nighttime. No one, we didn't even know if they did. No one's ever seen it. We didn't know if they happened. Um, and seeing these behaviors like this is a very rare behavior when you see two great whites go nose to nose to see who's bigger. But we, I spent two years and I caught the first great white breaching at nighttime that's ever been documented. And without those lights, would have never had that shot. No one would even know to this day if they did. So that was a, a two-year. I went up for one year and we didn't get it and I had to come back a year later. So that perseverance, that not giving up attitude, 
you know, once you have something for me, once I have something stuck in my head, a vision in my head, I will go to whatever length to get to make that happen. And I think that's a, a big, a big uh, reason for the success in my life. It's not giving up. It's, it's so easy to give up, but it's so much more rewarding to, to just plow through those walls and then achieve whatever you're trying to design or whatever you're trying to build, whether it's a website or a, you know, a, a, a design or a company. So to this point now, I, I've learned how to swim, which has been a dream of mine with great whites out of the cage, uh, which is, there's nothing like it. Uh, it's something that you have to be so, well, I'll, I'll show you guys some. Let's see how this works. So this is, I don't know if you can see it in there. Can you guys see that or is it too dark? Well, here's a great white coming. So when you swim with great whites, it's different than any other shark. Most other sharks, all they want is the fish, right? So if we didn't have the fish, they wouldn't even be after us. So great whites, it's a whole different ball of wax. So you see this great white and it's about, you know, 15 feet. It's maybe where the screen is away from me and it's cruising around and we have eye contact on each other and that's great. You're pretty much okay. But what you have to be is continually vigilant. It's like climbing Yosemite without ropes. You have to continue to look right, left, up, down, what you're going to see me doing here. But you see how fast he turns at me. He's sort of cruising. See how I'm looking down? I've got a 15-foot shark in front of me, but yet I have to continue to look down because it's not him that we're worried about. It's the one that you don't see. And, of course, I've got a yellow wetsuit that looks like a big yellow fin tuna. Um, and you know, believe me, they are attracted a little more to me than my buddies in the black wetsuits. Um, but, uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's, there's sort of nothing like it to, to swim with these animals. I mean, I have to remain completely humble and realize that they are a huge predator. And, um, but it, it was a goal of mine and, and, you know, what do they say? 10 years, 10,000 hours to master something. I've definitely put the time in, you know, to master. Well, you know, a dream of mine for 20-something years was to do a book with Tashin. And I've done, I mean, I would have always assumed my first book would be a celebrity book or something because that's what I've shot. And to do my first book with uh, with sharks and, it, and with Tashin was like a, a dream come true. And it's just being released this month. And I had a vision of it coming in a shark cage, which... The owner didn't see. Everyone else, I'm like, they're like, they get it. They're, oh, that's so cool. And Benedict was like, mm, no. <laughs> and I'm like, dude. So uh, a designer friend of mine actually made me a prototype. And I went over to his house, put it in front of him. And then he was like, ah, yeah. And his 21-year-old daughter came up. And she's like, wow, that's so fucking cool. And it was on. So we're making limited edition uh, shark books. Uh, it was neat to go to the Javits Center. I mean, this for me is like dream time come true. My first book, it's with Tashin, and it's of sharks. So there's the limited edition. You see the prototype. And that's the thing. If I didn't make that prototype, this wouldn't have happened. You know, there's my daughter. She's done, she, two, she's 11. She's done two great white shark expeditions. And to me, that's sort of what it's all about, man. It's family and the next generation and the kids and their kids. And that's what drives me in life, and that's why I make the sacrifices I do away from them. And I want to thank you all for being here and giving me the time, and it's been an honor to speak with you. I do have one little thing, though. I have a little, a, a little, a little Q and A, a little potential prize. I wanted to see a, if there's a raise of hand. If, if any of you in here know how many sharks a year we kill, does anyone know the answer? I need a specific answer. There's a big prize for if anyone knows the answer. Huh? 100,000? 1 million. 3 million. 
So none of you know. No one knows, huh? Fuck. I mean, no one gets the prize? Um, it's 100 million. 100 million sharks every year we kill. Um, and it sucks because I was going to give the person that good. I was going to be like, here's a book for you because you know the answer. Signed by me. So who can do their best shark impression? Get up here. <laughs> Yeah, it's 100 million, so, and they, and they kill six humans a year, that's the average, so it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. No one rarely knows the answer to that, which is why it's so mind-boggling. 100 million, and the sharks are at the top of very fragile ecosystems. You take the sharks out, it's like a domino effect, and they don't have the time to procreate, and the sustainability is just not, so that's why I do what I do. I mean, and no one has any idea, that's what, that, and it could be more, so... That's, that's, that's what drives me. But thank you again for, for listening to me today. It's been an honor to speak to you all. Have fun at the conference. Sorry I'm not tech, you know, um, you know, exo, code, web guy. I wish. I'm very, you know, enthralled by all of that. But, you know, those guys need creative to go on top of those X's and O's. So we all work together. Thank you.